Oxford Bookworms, Stage One. The coldest place on earth. Chapter Eight. Across the plateau. On November twenty-first, the Norwegians killed thirty dogs. They were happy, Amundsen said, and now they're going to die quickly. We need three sledges and eighteen dogs. To go to the pole. When the dogs were dead, the other dogs ate them. The men ate them too. They were good friends, Bjorland wrote in his diary, and now they are good food. Two days later, the dogs were fat. Then, in a snowstorm, they began the journey again. After the snowstorm. There was fog, and in the fog, they got lost on an ice river with hundreds of big holes in it. They could see nothing, and it was very dangerous. In four days, they moved nine kilometers. But the ice is beautiful, Bjorland wrote. Blue and green and white. This is a wonderful place. But I don't want to stay a long time. After the ice, there were strong winds and bad snowstorms. They could see nothing in front of them. But every day, they travelled twenty-five or thirty kilometers. Then, on December ninth, the sun came out. They were at eighty-eight degrees, twenty-three minutes south. One hundred and seventy-five kilometers from the pole. Five more long days, Bjorland wrote. That's all now. But where is Scott? For four days, Scott's men stayed in their tents near the mountains. There is a bad snowstorm outside, Oates wrote. It's too cold for the ponies. And our clothes and skis are bad too. On December ninth, Oates killed the ponies. They were tired and ill, and they could not walk up to the plateau. Then Mears and his dogs went back to Cape Evans. We can pull the sledges ourselves, Scott said. We can do it. We're all strong men. There were two sledges. And eight men. They went twenty-four kilometers a day. On December thirty-first, Scott said to Teddy Evans, and the men on the second sledge, "You can't ski well. Leave your skis here." So they pulled their sledge twenty-four kilometers without skis. Next day, Scott went to Teddy Evans's tent. "You are ill, Teddy," he said. You can't come to the pole. Take two men and go back tomorrow. Teddy Evans was very unhappy. Two men, Captain, he said. Why not three? Because Bowers is going to come with me, Scott said. He's strong. We need him. But you have food on your sledge for four men, not five, Evans said. And Bowers has no skis. I'm the captain, Teddy," Scott said. "You do what I say. Take two men and leave Bowers with me." Oates wrote to his mother. "I'm going to the pole with Scott. I am pleased and I feel strong. But in his diary he wrote, 'My feet are very bad.'" They are always wet now, and they don't look good. On January fourth, Scott's men left Teddy Evans and went on. Scott, Oates, Wilson, and Edgar Evans had skis, but Bowers did not. They were two hundred and seventy kilometers from the pole. December fourteenth, nineteen eleven. Was a warm, sunny day. 
five Norwegians skied over the beautiful white snow. It was very quiet. No one spoke. They were excited and happy. Six more kilometers, Bjorlund thought. Is there a British flag? I can't see a flag, but... Look, Hassel said. What's that over there? Bjorlund left his sledge and skied quickly away over the snow. What is it? he thought. Is it... No. It's nothing, he called. There's nothing there. Nothing. Three kilometers. Two. Ruald, Hansen called to Amundsen. Go in front of me, please. It helps my dogs. That's not true, Bjorlund thought. His dogs are running well today. But Hansen wants Amundsen to be first. The first man at the South Pole. They skied on and on, over the beautiful snow. Stop, Amundsen said. He waited quietly for his men. This is it, he said. Bjorland looked at him. But there's nothing here, he said. Amundsen smiled. Oh, yes, there is, he said. There's something very important here, Olaf. Very, very important. What's that, Ruald? Us. We are here now. Isn't that important, Olaf? The four men stood on the snow and looked at him. Then, slowly, they all began to laugh. Chapter 9 The End of the Race The Norwegians stayed two days at the Pole. They left a tent there, with a Norwegian flag on it. Inside the tent, they left some food, a letter for the King of Norway, and a letter for Scott. They left some more black flags near the Pole, and one twenty-eight kilometers north. Then they skied away, back to the north. It's a beautiful day, Bjorland wrote. The sun is warm, the snow is good. But the dogs run too quickly. I can't get in front of them. They found their depots easily. There were ten between the Pole and Framheim. Each depot had a lot of food. They laughed and skied quickly down the mountains. Often they skied fifty kilometers a day. On Friday, January 26th, 1912, they came back to Framheim. It was four o'clock in the morning. Inside the wooden house, Lindström, the cook, was asleep. Amundsen walked quietly to his bed. Good morning, Lindstrom, he said. Is our coffee ready? The black flags waited at the pole. What's that, Captain? Bowers said. Over there. Where? Scott asked. What? Oh, my God. They all saw the small black flag in the snow two kilometers in front of them. Slowly, they pulled their sledge to it. Next day, January 17th, 1912, they found the tent and the Norwegian flag. Near it, Scott took the British flag from under his clothes and put it up. In his diary, Scott wrote, this is a very bad day. We are all tired and have cold feet and hands. It is minus 30 degrees centigrade. And 
there is a snowstorm. Great God, this is an awful place. They turned north. Five tired, unhappy men in the coldest, emptiest place on earth. On March 13th, 1912, Scott's wife, Kathleen, looked at her morning newspaper. Norway's flag at South Pole, it said. She looked at it for a long time and then began to cry. What's the matter? her friend asked. My poor, poor husband, Mrs. Scott said. What's happened to him? Where is he now? Scott's men were always hungry. There were not many depots, and they were difficult to find. We need to find the next depot today, Oates wrote. But how can we find one black flag in all this snow? It's very difficult. And there is food for four men, not five. They were all tired and ill, too. Oates's feet were black now, and he could not feel them. On February 16th, Edgar Evans died. On the 17th, they were past the mountains. At the depot there, they ate one of the dead ponies. Then they went on. Ten, eleven, twelve kilometres a day. They were ill because their clothes were not warm and they didn't have much food. The temperature was sometimes minus 40 degrees centigrade. On March 7th, Scott looked at Oates's feet. They were big and black. I can't pull the sledge now, Oates said. It's very difficult to walk. Am I going to lose these feet, Captain? Scott looked at Oates's feet and said nothing. On March 9th, they found another depot, but there was not much food. Slowly, they walked on. Oates's feet were worse every day. March 17th was Oates's birthday. He was 32. He lay in the tent and listened to the wind outside. He was very cold, very hungry, and very, very tired. He wrote a letter to his mother and gave it to Wilson. Then he got up and opened the door of the tent. He stopped in the door for a minute. Scott, Wilson, and Bowers looked at him. They didn't speak. I'm going outside for a minute, Oates said. I may be some time. They didn't see him again. At Cape Evans, the Englishman waited. On December 11th, Mears and the dogs came back. On January 3rd, Teddy Evans and his two men arrived at Cape Evans. The Terra Nova came and went. Winter began. Scott did not come. The Englishman waited all winter at Cape Evans. Then, on October 26, 1912, they started for the south. Two weeks later, they found a tent. There were three bodies in the tent. Scott, Wilson and Bowers. They put the bodies under the snow. Then they took the men's letters and diaries and went north to Cape Evans again. In Scott's diary they read, Oates died like a good Englishman. We all did. 
Please remember us and look after our families. We did our best. No one found Oates's body, but he is there somewhere, under the snow and the wind, in the coldest, emptiest place on earth.